gonna wake up in the morning and the lawn gets out of warning I don't think I'll ever make it on time By the time I grab my books and I give myself a look I'm at the corner just in time to see the bus fly by It's alright cause I'm safe out of hell If the teacher pops a test I know I'm in a mess And my dog ate all my homework last night Riding low on my chair She won't know that I'm there If I can hand it in tomorrow It'll be alright It's alright Cause I'm saved by the bell It's alright Cause I'm saved by the So today, we're going to start a different series uh, called Throwback. Um, and so I don't have a video, but Ryan put together this great video. It had this cheesy uh, Saved by the Bell music. And any of you guys watched Saved by the Bell when you were a kid growing up? All right. So as we begin, part of this series is to reflect on our own stories. And so as we do, I think it's interesting how television shows actually shape us as our childhood. So we could actually probably go around and talk about the different TV series that shaped our childhood. So today I was going to play a little bit of a song of a TV series that shaped my childhood and see if you guys can guess what it is. Anybody watch this as a kid growing up? Anybody else? Yes. All right. I'm not alone. So, happy days. So, I grew up with the Fonz, all right? He was my hero. So, always thumbs up. And what was his saying? Hey, hey right? So, this TV sh series shaped my childhood. So, as we begin, we're going to reflect on Abraham and Sarah today. Then next week, we're going to talk about Isaac and Rebecca. The following week, we're going to talk about Jacob and Rachel. And then we're going to talk about Joseph. Also, I didn't say this earlier, but can you guys welcome the children in here? Thank you guys for joining us. We have children uh, here. They're usually next door, but you guys are welcome. I'm going to have to adjust a little bit of my sermon today because of that, because we're going to talk about some of that stuff um, that you don't talk about when certain people are here. So we're going to skim over that a little bit. So as we begin, a little background. One of the most important things when we as modern readers enter in and read through the Genesis narratives that is often overlooked and one of the most important historical events in the ancient Hebrew uh, culture was this thing called exile. Anybody familiar with that term exile? So the exile happened in 587 BCE to about 539 BCE, so about 50 years. So what happened was the, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, created this temple right, in Jerusalem. They worshiped God. And what happened in 530, 587 BCE is this empire, the Babylonian Empire, with King Nebuchadnezzar, came in and conquered the Israelites, destroyed the temple, shattered everything, and took thousands of the most influential and best people, uh, Israelites, and brought them back to Babylon. So all young people, anybody that could be trained up and, and sort of integrated in Babylonian culture was taken away. Any religious, political leaders were taken away. They were living in exile. So why was exile such a big deal? People of uh, Israel believed they were the chosen people of God. How they understood God, the name for God, the Hebrew name for God was Yahweh. They understood uh, or believed that they were God's chosen people, that God had set them apart and bless them to be a blessing to others. And that, um, that's hard to do when everything you know is destroyed and you're living in another country. Um, the temple was the center of their lives because their understanding, the temple housed the very presence of Yahweh. So when the temple is destroyed, that's a big deal. So where does God exist now? Where is God's presence now? Um, also, I think it's helpful for us to kind of understand a little bit of the, the cultural understanding of that time. Um, most of the people had what, what you would call like a tribal deity. And so you would have sort of like a, a tribe over here, group A, right? And they worshipped group A God. Maybe it was many gods, but at the top of the totem pole was group, 
God A. We'll just call it God A. And then you had group B over here, all right? And they might have worshipped a few gods, but at the top of the totem pole was God B, right? So what happened when these two tribes converged and fought? What happened when tribe A beat and conquered tribe B? Well, it was showing that tribe A's God, God A, was stronger than God B. So now tribe B would come under the influence of God A. Does that make sense to everybody? So this forms all kinds of problems. If you're the people of Israel and what just happened, you are tribe B. You just got conquered. And so it's in this setting that raises all kinds of questions that often are overlooked to the modern reader. So some of these questions, how did this happen? Why did we wind up here? Who are we? Their, their primary question was of a question of national identity. Who are we as a nation? What are we doing here? Um, the other question was questions about God. Is God weak? Has God been defeated? Has our God been defeated? Has our God unfaithful? Because God promised that uh, we would be a blessing to other people. And now we're not being blessed. We're actually under a curse. We're under other people's dominion. Okay? So these are the questions that shape the Hebrew Bible, especially Genesis. It's actually during the exile that Genesis uh, was written down. Now, it doesn't mean these stories existed orally for generations, and some of them may have been written, but it was during the exile, when these people were struggling with their identity, trying to understand who God was, that these stories emerged, the stories that we're going to be talking about in the next weeks emerge. They were written for a very specific purpose, to answer these questions. Who are we? What is our national identity? Who is God in the midst of this? They're living in a hopeless situation. They cannot see the future. They don't have hope, and they're wrestling with it. Does that make sense? So we're going to jump in to the Abraham uh, and Sarah story. So Genesis 12 begins. God basically, Yahweh, initiates a relationship with a 75-year-old guy named Abraham. Abraham lived in the city of Ur. All right? Ur, interestingly enough, is found in Babylon. So as we begin, you already see parallels that people in that time would have immediately drawn. It would have leaped off their pages. This guy is being called out of Babylon, all right? So let's read Genesis 12 and follow along in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. You will make, I will make a great nation of you. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you. I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So really quick, I'm going to take chunks of the Abraham story, because we're going to try to cover the whole Abraham story, and there's so many little stories, you could do a sermon on each one of those stories. So some of the times I'm just going to summarize like a whole chapter. Um, But as we go, a little backstory. Um, In the previous chapter, Genesis 11, uh, we are told that Abraham's father is Terah. Um, now, before we show the slide on Joshua, hold it for a second, if you can um, hold on to that. Um, Abraham, remember, came from where? Babylon. Came from the city of Ur. Ur was a city, a central city of the Mesopotamian uh, moon god Sin, S-I-N. So it was a major worship area of the Mesopotamian gods. So this is the culture that Abraham grew up in. All right? So we read in Joshua 24, and I think there's a slide for us there. Then Joshua said to the entire people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors lived in the other side of the Euphrates. They served other gods. Among them was Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor. So we see Abraham grew up in a polytheistic culture. We don't know much about Abraham's uh, background. What we do know, at least as far as scripture is telling us, that Abraham's father was uh, influenced and worshipped other gods. What we don't know is what influence that had on Abraham. So we're picking up a story, jumping in, Abraham's older, been influenced in this culture, is now being called to leave everything he knows, so everything that is familiar and journey on to a place that this God will show him when he gets there. So, um, where is Abraham living? Where was he from? Babylon, right? Where did he end up? Canaan, the promised land. 
So immediately, these writers are drawing parallels. Where are they living in exile right now? In Babylon. Where are they from and where are they yearning to go? Back home into Canaan, into Jerusalem. There's already all of these parallels here. So um, periodically, I'm going to give some takeaways. The first takeaway I have from even the first few uh, verses is this. We all have a call in our lives. The question isn't, am I called, but am I listening? So God spoke, called Abraham away from everything that was familiar, right? Um, I've been doing a lot of work and and kind of inner work and trying to uh, wrestle through calling and vocation and all that, what that means. Um, And I used to think, oh, a few people were called, like the priests. You know, they hear a call from God and they go serve God. But what I've come to the conclusion is that every one of us have a calling on our life. And a calling goes much deeper than just your job. It has to do with who you are. Um, You're sum total of your personality um, and your person, your livelihood. So in a way, some of us are called to be parents or husbands or wives. Um, Some of us have a calling to work in a certain area. Some of us may be called to live in a certain geographic region. Some of us may sense a call to be a part of this um, community of one church. So calling is so far beyond just your job. But we all are called, I think. The question isn't are we called, but are we listening? And there's an ancient um, Midrash tradition. Uh, Anybody familiar with Midrash? It's kind of um, an an older Jewish way of understanding scriptures. Uh, And they speak of um, the burning bush and Moses. Where Moses comes up, he meets God in a burning bush, and this is where God tells him to go and um, set God's people free in Egypt and liberate the slaves. Well, there's this old Midrash tradition that says that the bush was always burning. Moses was just the first to stop and listen and take enough time to hear. And I think that's true of all of us. So if we're wrestling through calling, I think the first thing is we are all called, and then to take the time to actually listen and stop. So, um, Genesis chapter 11 and 12 set up this massive conflict. Um, it actually begins in Genesis 12, but we have to go through, to understand the conflict, we have to go back through to Genesis 11. And I'll just read one verse in verse 30. But Sarai, which was Abraham's wife, was unable to become pregnant and had no children. So, what does that mean? Now, that's a struggle for sure, but in the ancient world, it was a huge struggle. Walter Brueggemann, who's a, um, one of the, the top Old Testament scholars, um, says that infertility is an effective metaphor for hopelessness. No human power to invent a future. And then we move on to Genesis chapter 12, where God tells Abraham, I will make you a great nation. So like any arc, any narrative, it begins with you know, character development, conflict, and it climaxes, and then conflict resolution, right? So we're entering into the conflict right away, where God says, I've called you to be a great nation, only guess what, your wife can't have children. I want to take a moment to sort of address the fact that, that some of us um, in here, and many of us I know, um, that we, we have friends and people we know that have struggled with infertility. It is um, a massive struggle. If you talk to anyone or if you've gone through it yourself, um, it's, it's um, extremely difficult. And it's not something to be taken lightly. So I wanted to take a moment and recognize that and also mention two quick things. Um, it's easy to, to come up with questions when something like, hap- like that happens. Like, why me? Where is God in the midst of this? Why doesn't God bring about uh, deliverance? Why doesn't God allow me to get pregnant? So number one, two quick points. Number one, um, it's okay to raise questions. So we are a church that one of our core values is actually questions and doubts are welcome. So the first thing, it's actually okay to raise questions. The second thing, Issues like infertility, or why the innocent suffer, or why somebody got sick and died versus someone else who lived. These are very complex questions. Often, people will try to answer complex questions, giving very simple answers, and it always falls short. It just, it never seems to work, and in fact, it seems to make things worse. So some of these, I've heard um, that people have lost loved ones, And others have said, well, God just took your mother or your father away because God needed another angel, which is a simple answer to a very complex question. And you can see how that will eventually or could eventually create all kinds of problems later on. Maybe the best thing to do isn't to try to give an answer to those people who are asking those questions, but maybe the best thing is to actually walk alongside with them, sharing in that struggle. 
Um, so that's point number two. Um, so back to Genesis 12. God follows, um, or Abraham follows God's leading. Abraham leaves everything that is known, all right, and follows God to the unknown. So we're going to pick up in Genesis 12, verses 10, and I think there's a slide for us. When a famine struck the land, Abraham went down towards Egypt to live as an immigrant, since the famine was so severe in the land. So when you follow God's leading, everything's supposed to work out perfectly well, right? I mean, we have this undergird like, thought that if we follow God, God will bless us and everything will go great, like a red carpet just rolled out and we just walk along it. What's the first thing that happens when Abraham le leaves everything he knows? He arrives in Canaan. The next thing we read, what happens? Famine. Now he has to pick up and move from there down to Egypt. So Egypt had an abundance of water with the Nile and everything else. So the first thing that happens to him is conflict. Have you ever followed God's leading or felt like you were following God's call? You stepped out and you hit a wall. You found it was a dead end. You discovered an obstacle. It's easy in those situations to raise all kinds of questions. Did I hear God right? Did God really say, am I following God? I can imagine these are questions that Abraham was wrestling with as well. So take away from this. Following God's leading doesn't guarantee smooth sailing. Following God doesn't guarantee smooth sailing. The things we value most in life actually take the most amount of work, don't they? Life is much more of an adventure. We set sail, we go out. It's the unknown. Sometimes we run into massive storms. We break down. We're stranded on the island, and we don't know if we're ever going to get out, right? Following God is not a simple, easy, straightforward plan. We read that from Abraham, who went down to Egypt, and of course, there was a famine. So we continue on the Abraham narrative in Genesis 12, um, verses 11 and 12. Just before he arrived in Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarai, I know you're a good-looking woman. When Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but let you live. So tell them you are my sister so that they will treat me well for your sake, and I will survive because of you. Awesome. So apparently, Sarah is a hot 65-year-old woman, all right? And Abraham is a man of courage and says, why don't you just lie and pretend like I'm your brother, all right? And what ends up happening as a result of this? We have a slide up here that'll show us. Um, it's kind of summarizing what happens next. So first, Sarah becomes the property of Pharaoh. Pharaoh and his household then become cursed because of it, according to the narrative. Pharaoh wants nothing to do with Abraham's God. And finally, Pharaoh commands Abraham to leave Egypt. and Get out of here. You lied to me. You brought this curse. Now get out. These parallel another story that would have stood out to those in exile. So on the next slide, we have a story called the Exodus narrative. So what happens in the Exodus narrative? Israelites become Pharaoh's property. Pharaoh and Egyptians endure curses, the ten plagues. Pharaoh wants nothing to do with Israel's God. Pharaoh commands the Israelites to leave Egypt. There's massive parallels to both of these stories. What brought Abraham to Egypt? Famine. What brought um, Joseph's family to Egypt? Famine. Tons of parallels going on here that the people um, in the ancient world living in exile would have picked up on right away. So we move on. I'm going to summarize a couple chapters here. Genesis 13. Uh, Abraham comes back from Egypt after he's le left. Uh, he has an argument with his nephew Lot. Basically, there's not enough room for both of all their herds to eat, and so they get into this discussion. Um, and Abraham's character actually shines through, and he says, okay, there's not enough food here. If you want to go right, I'll go left. If you want to go left, I'll go right. Let's just try to settle this. I'll let you pick. So that's what happens then. In Genesis 14, um, Lot is actually captured and taken away. So now Abraham has to pick up, take a bunch of men, and go and rescue his nephew Lot. Not easy, not straightforward. It's constant struggle after struggle after struggle. So we pick up in Genesis 15. Uh, and I think we have a slide here. It says, After these events, the Lord's word came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your protector. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can possibly give me since I still have no children? The head of my household is Eleazar, a man from Damascus. He continued, since you haven't given me any children, the head of my household will be my heir. 
So Abraham doubts God's promise here. After everything he's been through, he goes and he doubts. He's not certain. So we continue reading on in Genesis 15. The Lord's word came immediately to Abraham. This man will not be your heir. Your heir will definitely be your own biological child. Then he brought Abram outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars if you think you can count them. God continued, This is how many children you will have. So Abraham trusted the Lord, and the Lord recognized Abram's high moral character. Take away from this. Faith is not the absence of questions and doubts. Faith is continuing on in spite of your questions and doubts. For some reason, sometimes we think that faith means absolute certainty. But we read from the story of Abraham and many stories that these people doubted, struggled, had conflicts, and yet continued on. Faith is not the absence of questions and doubts. So, Genesis 16, um, summarizing this really quick. Sarah gives Abraham her servant. Um, uh, Sarah gives Abraham uh, her servant, Hagar. All right? Um, so, PG means um, you know what happens there. Uh, Abraham um, impregnates, <laughs> impregnates uh, Hagar. Um, so, she's pregnant. Hagar gets mad and jealous because of it, right? Um, and then basically treats her unkindly, probably beats her. Hagar then runs away. Then an angel or a messenger comes and meets Hagar where she was at. Bizarre stories, right? I, this, crazy. All right, so Genesis 16, then the, the messenger meets Hagar and says, the Lord's messenger said to her, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You will name him Ishmael because the Lord has heard about your harsh treatment. So I'm rushing through tons of stories here, trying to give us like a big, broad overview. Abraham took things into his own hands uh, with Sarah's influence. And this was considered legal then. Now it's kind of really bizarre, like your servant. For, I mean, we don't have slaves. Secondly, we don't make slaves our wives and have, you know, surrogate mothers through that. So he has a son. All right. But in that time, people actually did this. And this was considered legal and okay practice. Abraham took things into his own hands. So this is a takeaway I got from this. God works through our mistakes and failures to bring about good. It's interesting. We kind of overlook this. Um, but the, the messenger, the angel, meets Hagar and says, I will bless you. Go back. Even in the midst of mistakes, even in the midst of taking things into our own hands, God still works through it. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences to our actions, right? Sometimes it makes things more complex, makes things harder. But I've run into, bumped into, talked to many people who feel like they're walking on eggshells always around God. Like, if I mess up, God's going to get so angry and just vengeful and wrathful. And actually, the, the Abraham story tells quite the opposite. God is leading Abraham. Sometimes Abraham gets it wrong. And you know what? God still works through it. Um, we actually have lived here almost a year in Phoenix. We're from Colorado. Um, and right before we moved here, uh, I helped a lady move from Colorado to another state. She was leaving her husband. So I helped her move from there to another state. I actually, we just got back from Colorado yesterday. So I bumped into this lady who is now living back in Colorado. Uh, and she told me her story, which was great. But she says, now I feel so, um, so alive, so at peace, and so right with God. I felt like leaving and moving to where I did was wrong. I took things into my own hands and I struggled because of it. But now I feel like God was working through it and somehow our marriage is better than ever and stronger than ever and I feel at peace. And I want to be careful because I'm not saying that anytime anybody leaves a partner that it's always wrong. I'm just giving you a story, an example of how God works through somebody's mistake, taking things into their own hands. Sometimes we don't know and we're just stepping out and then we realize later, oh, that was a mistake. Yet God seems to be working through it. So take a moment and reflect on your own life, your own story, your own journey. Are there times where you made a mistake, you messed up, and you can see yet God was still bringing about good through it? All right, continuing on. Genesis 17, God introduces circumcision. Um, sign of a new covenant. Uh, we're not going to talk about this. There's a lot of things here. Circumcision was not uncommon then. Um, so other people did it. This was to enact the promise that you are my chosen people. Blessed, why? To be a blessing. 
So it was never so they can have everything, so they can be better than everyone else, but they were blessed to be a blessing. So in Genesis 17, God introduces circumcision. Genesis 18, three visitors appear to Abraham. Two of them appear to be angels, and one appears to be God uh, on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're going to tackle the Sodom and Gomorrah story here. Um, on their way there, they stop. They tell Abraham and Sarah, you guys are going to have a child within a year. They still haven't seen their promise fulfilled. They're still living in that hopeless situation. So here, uh, God again reminds them and says, within a year, you will have a child. So Genesis 19. Um, I didn't make a slide for this because there's a lot here, but I'm just going to read to you guys a little bit of the Sodom and Gomorrah story. The two messengers, so after they had visited with Abraham and Sarah, they journeyed on. They entered Sodom in the evening. Lot, remember Lot was Abraham's nephew, who was sitting at the gate of Sodom, saw them, got up to greet them, and bowed low. He said, come to your servant's house, spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you can get up early and go on your way. But the two messengers said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. They were going there to examine the town of Sodom and Gomorrah to get a feel. Are they as wicked and as bad as everyone says they are? But they said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. So Lot pleaded earnestly with them. So they went with him and entered into his house. He made a big meal for them, even baking unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, surrounded the house and called out to Lot. Where are the men who arrived tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. That's my PG version, by the way. <laughs> Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Uh, Lot went out toward the entrance, closed the door behind him, and said, My brothers, don't do such an evil thing. I've got two daughters who are virgins. Let me bring them to you, and you may do to them whatever you wish. But don't do anything to these men, because they are now under the protection of my roof. So in this story, two angels enter a city. Lot convinces them to spend the night at his place. Apparently, all of the men come to his house and demand, um, demand to know the men, um, basically to rape these supposedly male angels. Lot instead says, here's my virgin daughters. Have fun. What a crazy, bizarre story. There's so much going on here. Sometimes you read the, the stories in the Bible and you're like, Oh my goodness, what were these people thinking? Bizarre, ancient. This is an ancient way of understanding the world, ancient practices. But this story has often been used as um, a sort of clobber passage against gays and lesbians. So let's, let's kind of um, analyze this. Unfortunately, it's been used as a clobber passage because people actually don't really read it. We connect all kinds of dots that aren't there. First of all, a lot of the reasoning would go along like this. Well, the Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah was wicked, right? right? Uh, the men living there wanted to have sex or rape the other men, right? So they were wicked. The men wanted to do that. So thus, being gay or being a lesbian is evil, wrong, sinful, right? So we're all kind of familiar with this line of reasoning. But is that what really is going on here? So when the messenger appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18, um, I didn't talk about this, but what does Abraham do? He greets them, welcomes them, feeds them, and allows them to spend the night. This was ancient practice of hospitality, right? And we can actually see this throughout the uh, Hebrew scriptures. How you treat, especially those that, that don't have a voice, the oppressed, the marginalized, the poor, the fatherless, the widow, reflects you as a person. Hospitality was a way to provide for those that could not provide. They were traveling, right? You would welcome somebody who was traveling a long distance and say, here, you're tired, sleep here, eat heal here. It was a way of showing compassion to others. The same thing happens when the two men enter into Sodom and Gomorrah. What does Lot do? He, he basically urges them, convinces them, come spend the night at my house. When they do that, they are under the protection of Lot here. So um, Lot is extending hospitality to them as well. Uh, there's so much here going on, I can't get into everything. Um, but the question is, what did the people of Sodom and Gomorrah do? Did they welcome the sojourner? No. Um, what did they do? Uh, they wanted basically to, to gain rape these male angels, right? And so does that automatically mean then that they 
because of that that they were gay. We're drawing connections here that I don't think are there. So an example, in our modern context, if there was a male who went to jail or prison and got raped, does that automatically mean that he was raped because he or they were gay? No, what does it mean? It's a power play, right? It's a show of dominance, right? It's meant to shame the other person. It's meant to show like the hierarchy. Hey, you're here, you're nothing. It has nothing to do, I don't think, with sexual orientation, actually in the least. It has everything to do with an outward reflection of the wickedness, of their show of dominance, of their lack of hospitality, of their lack of compassion to the outsider. So it's interesting then how a story that has everything to do with how you treat other people, how you extend, include, and show compassion has been twisted to now become a story of how we exclude and show sort of hate towards other people. It's so interesting how that can happen. So we move on. Sodom and Gomorrah, what does it teach us? So the takeaway I put, how we treat others reflects our righteousness. And we see this throughout scripture. This is kind of the old, um, um, works versus faith argument that we see in the New Testament too. Where in the book of James, I think James says, um, yeah, you say you have faith, um, but I don't see your works. I don't see your outward ways that you treat other people. But I will show you that I have faith by the way I treat other people, by the works that I do. Um, a good fruit, or a good tree produces good fruit. So you can look at a tree outwardly and say, inside, they're alive and they're living. So this is the kind of the tension that we see. How we treat others reflects our own righteousness. Not, sometimes we feel like our, our morality is what we don't do, or if I don't smoke, or if I don't cuss. But I think God's much more concerned with how we treat others, and how we, we, um, we extend compassion and grace to others. So moving on, you guys still with me? I know this is a lot. Um, I don't usually teach like this, but here we go. Genesis 21, uh, Isaac is finally born. So Moses, or not Moses, Abraham has waited to see this promise fulfilled. So what happens then in Genesis 22? We continue on the bizarre stories of Abraham. So Genesis 22, verse 2, God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up as an entirely burnt offering there on one of the mountains that I will show you. Crazy. Okay, so God says, I will bless you. Finally, he gives a son, and then God says, go and sacrifice your son to me. What a bizarre story. So some people struggle with this. There's different ways of interpreting this and different ways of understanding this. This is going to reflect my way of interpreting this and understanding this. Um, first of all, it would not have been uncommon in that ancient world for someone to sacrifice their firstborn to a god. That was considered normal practice. Where was Abraham from? Ur. Was he familiar with their ancient ways of sacrifices, um, ancient ways of how they worship gods then? Very much so. This could have been very easily an extension of that. We're all influenced, if we're honest, we're all influenced by our culture, by our upbringing, by the way we understand God. So it would not have been that crazy for Abraham to think, oh, God blessed me, let me show my appreciation by my sacrifice. It's the same thing um, with uh, animal sacrifices that they did back then. It's always a sacrifice to appease the God or the gods, right? So we get enough rain. Humanity basically came to a place where we're aware that our livelihood depends upon greater forces. So the rains come, we get enough rain. What do we do? Well, we sacrifice to show our thanks to the rain god. That's what we do. If we didn't get enough sun, what do we do? We sacrifice and hope to appease the sun god. There are fertility gods. What happens when the fertility god blesses you, right? These are ancient practices. What is interesting about this story isn't so much that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son because, to be honest, that, that happened in that time, but what happened next? When he gets to the sacrifice, about ready to sacrifice his own son, what does God do? God stops him and says, no, don't continue. This was unheard of. God doesn't stop you in the midst of sacrifice. Not only that, but what does God do next? God then provides a sacrifice in place, right? Which is a pretty amazing story, especially then. Gods don't provide sacrifices. Humans provide sacrifices to the gods. In this story, it radically reverses it. Uh, I see it to be honest, as Abraham's growing revelation, understanding of who God 
is. Where did he come from? Er. He was traveling, learning, understanding, growing in his awareness, growing in understanding of who God is. The same thing can be said of us. If we reflect on our lives, probably 5, 10, 20 years ago, have we changed? Have we grown? Right? Have we learned new things? This is what I see in this story. So in conclusion, kind of wrapping up the Abraham narrative, along with all the other Genesis stories, what is sort of the big picture that the people living in exile would kind of hold on to? Uh, the big takeaway will be that God, sh- the God who showed God's self to be faithful to Abraham will also be faithful to those of us living in exile. So this was written, I think, and shown directly. This is how God works. This is the kind of God we worship. So taking a hopeless situation, reflecting on another hopeless situation, and how God moved and brought about hope. So in the New Testament, Abraham is held up not just as a hero of faith, but kind of as the epitome, the hero of faith. Um, Taken from uh, Hebrews 11, which is sort of the roll call of the great heroes of faith, most of the people uh, talked about in there get one verse, one verse per person. Moses actually gets six verses in Hebrews 11. Guess how many Abraham gets? Twelve. Abraham is propped up as sort of the epitome of a faithful hero, right? Um, So here's a few questions, and you can follow along on the slide here. Did Abraham ever doubt? Did Abraham make mistakes? Was Abraham unfaithful at times? Wherever you are at on your journey... Maybe right now you're sensing God's calling you out, leading you from unknown, unfamiliar, or from the familiar into the unknown, into the unfamiliar. Maybe you're wrestling through your sense of calling uh, and, and in life. Uh, maybe it's a job that you're in transition, a life, whatever it is. Maybe you've stepped out and followed the call. Um, you've traveled, you've journeyed, you've run into some obstacles along the way. Maybe you've hit a brick wall and began to second guess, did I hear God right? Is this supposed to happen? Uh, Maybe you know you have taken things into your own hands, and maybe you just needed to hear that God still works through our mistakes today. Maybe you have uh, lacked in faith at times and thought, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how God's going to work through this. Maybe the future for you seems hopeless. So what is a takeaway for us in the 21st century? I think it's the same takeaway it was for those living in exile. The God who showed God's self to be faithful to Abraham will also be faithful to those of us living in the 21st century. So the story of Abraham is a story of taking from going from hopelessness unto hope. So as we conclude, finally, I wanted to read a New Testament verse. It's in 2 Timothy, and it says this, if we are faithful, he, meaning God, remains, if we are unfaithful, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. So the good news, I think, is that no matter what we have done, no matter where we are on our journey, as we reflect back on the story of Abraham and Sarah, and we reflect on our own stories, we can trust that God will remain faithful, even when we can't see, even when we don't know, even when we're not sure how things work out, God will remain faithful.